been called a maverick, a genius, a pioneer, and a fetus, touching the hearts of millions of people around the world and dementing equally as many. The most controversial figure in popular music today, we explore the twisted and erotic world of the Pianissimo. If I could rewrite, or if I could remember the way that I feel it happened, then I was sitting there, listening to the static on the radio, and I was hearing the most gorgeous things. Pianissimo was, uh, I feign to use the word brilliant, but he was certainly a creative individual with uh, an exorbitant amount of talent, uh, perhaps focused in the wrong direction. We were constantly trying to tell him to make more commercially viable music and less Well, let's just say that I was the crank on a slot machine and I just needed somebody to pull it. And he, Alan Gurkin was that guy. He made it happen. I am the unfortunate soul who carried Pianissimo from his humble beginnings to what would now be described as a worldwide phenomenon. My dad, who is no longer here with us now, though I'm sure he would have hated my music, was basically a very wealthy um, stockholder. So growing up for me was never tough. I'm really not sure where the entire uh, background story involving wealth comes from. Uh, when I found Pianissimo, he was literally living in squalor. Uh, he was in the streets, uh, drinking puddles of what I believe to be oil, trying to uh, scrimp enough nutrients together to constitute a meal. Um, he had scurvy for the first three years we worked together. It's just when I realized that I was hearing frequencies that no one heard, I knew nobody would care, but I, I couldn't help but explore them, and, and sure, I faced mass rejection, but I think, like I said, all the money I made from those royalty checks, it, it's just done me a lot of good, because I've been able to finance my more esoteric ideas. Uh, as he became more profitable, he certainly became more demented. There was no question about that. And I feel like... I've cured people, whether they know it or not, because I'm cleansing the palate. Now, in 1965, me and Pianissimo released the uh, classic album, uh, I Am Now Slowly Entering Your Coin Purse. Uh, at the time, I believed that this was going to skyrocket him to success. Now, the millions of sales didn't seem to mean anything to Pianissimo, because when we released his follow-up album, um, Can You Smell Me? Uh, he did what I would say is nothing short of uh, fans. Uh, I don't know if there's a better word to use for it. He the ears of his fans with his second release. I mean, I could make music with a P, like a single little P. I could take a fork and I could go psh, psh, and I could make some big rhythms. Pinissimo was very bent on making trilogies. He had a lot of... Uh, albums that were released in threes. Uh, most of these albums only had three songs. Each one was about three seconds in length. Um, we had told him before that you can't possibly sell an entire album that's only a collective nine seconds. If I take a bunch of spoons and I do a bum drop on the piano keys, it's gonna make a sound that wouldn't be possible if I played some scales. The funny thing about this is, is I was very specific when I told him that this is not profitable, I can't sell this, no one will pay a cent for static. Then maybe I'd hop around and see if people were more open-minded in other galaxies, in other time eras, and maybe me throwing a piano down the stairs or composing a piece purely by stopwatch intervals will be accepted and will be normal. Once Pianissimo became more famous, uh, the fame really acted as a drug, almost as much as the drugs which Pianissimo was readily consuming on a regular basis. I think all artists and rock stars, especially, do a lot of drugs. The only difference is, when I am tweaking out, 
I'm tweaking out to some righteously tweak shit. Pianissimo was certainly a uh, original individual. He would not follow any of the popular trends. And when most rock stars were using, say, coke or heroin, Pianissimo would be the one in the party who would walk to the kitchen sink and see what he could find. He became quite adept uh, at locating the more potent potables, if you will. Pianissimo was certainly a fan of comics. Let's put it this way. I used to live near a store that sold comics. Very near the store. I'm being blatantly honest here. We knew we had a problem when uh, Pianissimo would start to ask for tours uh, in cities that had the most hardware stores. I had a friend who was quite open-minded, I, I thought, and they were basically willing, you know, to, to, to watch my back, at least I thought. But they gave me a suggestion one day, they said, man, everything changed for me when I was huffing these paint fumes. And I thought for a second, this is total garbage. But then five minutes later, I lit up one, and it seemed like a fairly decent idea. You know, like, what's going to happen to me when I have this paint? Am I going to have some sort of spiritual, sacred experience? Clearly, huffing paint fumes wasn't uh, the biggest problem on Pianissimo's plate. Uh, between the sexual depravity, uh, the drops in record sales, uh, the arrests, the controversies, the indictments, um, the extortions, the blackmails, uh, the excommunications, uh, he really didn't fall into any serious trouble until uh, the hate crimes. I think Alan Gherkin must have been wearing two pirate patches, one in each eye, because that never happened. What probably happened is I was hooking up some effects to a chain and I was making some sounds that maybe sounded fairly aquatic and maybe clicky or maybe created the feeling of that pulsation, you know what I'm talking about? Me and Pianissimo certainly parted ways uh, on a bitter note. I told him to stop running over my dog and he responded by saying it's music. They're my blender, the critics are my blender, I put them in the blender and I go like that, and then they're just another piece in the puzzle. They're just another sound in my palette. Even when I'm in my grave, I'll be doing my Dig Me Out Requiem. <laughs>